Well, hello and welcome once again to APHA's 15 on COVID-19 series. I'm your host, Dan Zlot, and today we're going to be talking about adenovirus vaccine technology in light of the recent emergency use authorization of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, we're going to dive into this. I know there's been a lot of questions about exactly how these vaccines work, what are safety concerns, etc. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. As usual, I have nothing to disclose. And here are our learning objectives for today. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump in here and really take a look at how adenovirus-based vaccines work. To start off with, we'll do a little review of some basic biology. We've done this before when we looked at how mRNA-based vaccine technologies worked. So the first thing, of course, is uh, just a refresher on cellular biology. So the basic dogma of biology is that uh, we start off with DNA, which is uh, transcribed into RNA, and in this case, mRNA is usually what we're looking at. And then that mRNA is then translated into proteins. And those proteins are the things that build our cells, help us uh, send hormone signals, etc. So proteins play a huge uh, array of roles within the body, and we've listed a few of those things there. But this is the general flow of how information goes from uh, DNA and actually turns into proteins. And so we're going to be taking advantage of various elements of this process uh, through adenovirus-based vaccines. Uh, of course, this is an, a little bit of an oversimplification. There's a lot more that goes on, but it'll help us kind of get pointed in the right direction. In order to understand how uh, adenoviruses can serve as COVID-19 vaccines, it's useful to take a step back and first examine how normal adenoviruses function. So the first thing to understand about adenoviruses is that they're extremely common. Uh, typically, they cause upper respiratory tract infections, but they can also cause GI infections, and in very rare circumstances, neurologic or urinary tract infections. For the most part, adenoviral infections are extremely mild. Think of a common cold, mild GI symptoms, etc. However, if you happen to be immunocompromised, uh, the infections can become more severe, and that tends to be when you get into the neurologic or urinary tract infection uh, pathway. So again, those are pretty rare infections, thankfully. Now, adenoviruses themselves are non-enveloped, meaning that they do not have a phospholipid bilayer or membrane around them. They're encapsidated, meaning that they have a protein capsid surrounding their core material where their genome as well as some of those um, core proteins are stored and they're double-stranded DNA viruses. And both strands of DNA are important. They code for different things. And so we're gonna be taking advantage of that in order to deliver a payload. Now, another feature of adenoviruses that makes them particularly attractive as uh, vaccine vectors is that they have broad tropism. And what that means is that they can infect a huge variety of different cells. And so again, if you look at uh, the, the different systems that they infect, respiratory tract, GI, neurologic, et cetera, it makes sense. They can infect a lot of different types of cells. Additionally, there are many species affected by adenoviruses, so uh, animals in addition to humans, and we're going to be taking advantage of that uh, when we start talking about some of the different uh, vaccines that are in development. Now, adenoviruses gain entry into the cell. Um, it's a kind of a two-step process. So the first step is that the knob, and so on the screen you can see an image of uh, an adenovirus, and so there's the knob connected to a fiber which is connected to the capsid. So the first thing that happens is that that knob protein binds to a receptor. And there are a number of different receptors that adenoviruses can actually access or bind to. The most common receptor is the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor. So once that binds, there are some additional proteins around the base of the fiber uh, that then also bind to the cell, and that combination allows for the virus to gain entry into the host cell. Now, once the virus is into the cell, the capsid, the protein capsid destabilizes, and that releases the viral proteins and the DNA into the cellular cytoplasm. Some of those viral proteins help the DNA enter the cell's nucleus via the nuclear pores. And then uh, from there, that DNA does what DNA does. It gets translated um, into proteins. And we'll talk about that in just a second. One important thing to note is that the DNA does not integrate into the host genome. And we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. Uh, but uh, unlike 
say, the HIV virus, which does in fact incorporate its uh, genetic material into the host genome, adenoviruses do not. Uh, so then uh, the virus does what viruses do. It basically takes advantage of the host machinery to make more copies of the virus. So now that we know how adenoviruses normally work, let's talk about how we can take advantage of them to create a vaccine. Now, when we want to use them as a vaccine vector, we manipulate the gen genetic material of the virus. And we do that by doing two things. The first thing is to insert genes coding for the antigen of interest, in this case, the COVID-19 spike protein. At the same time, we remove genes that are necessary for viral replication. And this results in a virus that's replication incompetent. So it can infect cells, deliver the genetic payload that we want it to deliver, but then it's not able to make more copies of itself. So I like to think of it at a little bit of a higher level. And essentially what viruses do is they hijack our cellular machinery in order to reproduce. And what we're doing is we're hijacking the virus's ability to hijack our cellular machinery as a way to get them to deliver a payload that we want them to deliver and to produce proteins that we want them to deliver. We have a really hard time uh, getting cells to produce proteins that we want on, uh, you know, kind of on their own. And so this is a very elegant way uh, to use sort of a, a guided missile uh, to deliver a, a genetic payload exactly where we want it. And that's what's going on with uh, adenoviruses when we use them as COVID-19 vaccines. So how do these vaccines actually work? Um, just a different way of presenting some of the same information. Uh, really what they do is they turn our cells into mini vaccine manufacturing facilities. So as we talked about on a previous slide, we uh, take the viral genome and we manipulate it. So we introduce DNA that codes for the desired antigen and we eliminate essential components of the viral, viral genome, which results in a replication incompetent virus. And from there, uh, the virus is then injected into the patient and the virus does what viruses do. It infects host cells and delivers our DNA payload. That DNA enters the cellular nucleus and is transcribed into mRNA. And that mRNA is then translated into the antigen or protein or amino acid chain uh, that we are d intending uh, for the virus to help our cells make. Again, in this case, the COVID-19 spike protein. From there, um, our bodies develop an immune reaction against that antigen and that immune reaction helps us develop an immune memory uh, and prevent infection, in this case, against COVID-19. And so uh, that is sort of the, the process of how adenovirus-based vaccines work at a very high level. Now, there are, of course, some limitations to using adenoviruses as uh, vaccines. So the first one is that adenoviruses are extremely common pathogens. As we talked about, almost every person on Earth has been exposed to adenoviruses at some point in their life. So it stands to reason that many of us have developed an immune response, in other words, antibodies, against adenoviruses. Some of those uh, antibodies may be neutralizing antibodies, meaning that those antibodies will prevent the adenovirus from infecting our cells. But in this instance, we actually want the adenovirus to infect our cells so that it can deliver the genetic payload that codes for the COVID-19 spike protein, which will then allow us to develop an immune response against COVID-19. So how do we get around this? Well, typically what the developers of these types of vaccines do is they select adenovirus serotypes or subtypes that are not as common uh, in order to minimize the likelihood that we will have uh, neutralizing antibodies already. And so we'll talk about that when we get to the J&J &J vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. They chose some relatively rare uh, subtypes of adenovirus to use as their vaccine platform. Additionally, even if uh, there are neutralizing antibodies. Uh, there's good data out there that adenovirus-based vaccines can still elicit a potent immune response against uh, the desired antigen. So this data comes from the CanSino trial where they're using an adenovirus 5-based vector. Um, adenovirus uh, serotype 5 is one of the most common serotypes of adenovirus out there. But in their, in their trials, they still demonstrated that uh, patients were able to develop uh, very good antibody responses against COVID-19. So it seems like this may be less of an issue as long as you get the dosing right.
So let's talk about some of the vaccines that are in development. I touched on some of these already. Uh, the Janssen vaccine is an adenovirus serotype 26 based genetically modified replication incompetent adenoviral vector. And of course, as we all know, that was granted emergency use authorization uh, on February 27th. And so that was the now the third uh, COVID vaccine to be granted emergency use authorization in the United States. And I uh, also touched on this one, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is a chimpanzee-based adenovirus, uh, which was also genetically modified, uh, resulting in a replication incompetent adenoviral vector. Uh, the EUA submission is still pending. They've not actually submitted their information uh, to the FDA as of the date of this recording. Now, uh, one of the questions, we're getting a lot of questions about uh, the use of adenovirus vaccines uh, from patients. And I think on the front lines, I'm sure you're getting a lot of these questions as well. And so let's talk about some of the common questions and maybe some of the tools that you can use to help overcome potential vaccine hesitancy. So one of the first things is, are these vaccines safe? And the answer is yes. Uh, Adenovirus-based vaccines have been studied in humans for more than 15 years. We've got a significant amount of experience with them. We've experienced a couple bumps on the road, and I'll talk about those in some detail, but uh, we definitely know um, that these are safe and can be used very effectively. Uh, the U.S. military actually uses live adenovirus vaccines to immunize troops and trainees and has for a number of years. Now, those vaccines are intended to immunize troops against adenoviruses, uh, but we do know that it's safe to use adenoviruses as immunization platforms. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, adenovirus-based vaccines do not insert their genes into the host cell's genome. And so that means there's an extremely low risk of genetic alteration to host cells, which is one of the concerns uh, anytime you start talking about injecting DNA into cellular uh, processes into the nucleus of cells. So because uh, they do not incorporate their DNA into the genome, that's a very low likelihood of uh, some of the consequences of genetic alterations, you know, cancers down the road, et cetera, as a result of this infection. And finally, adenoviruses are extremely common, as we mentioned. So almost all of us have been exposed to adenoviruses at some point in our life. So utilizing them as a, a vector to deliver a vaccine really doesn't pose any significant risk. So I mentioned earlier that there have been a few bumps along the road uh, in the development of adenovirus-based vectors, and there have been, so let's talk about some of those. Um, some of your more well-read patients may know that in the late 1990s, there was actually a uh, death uh, from an adenovirus-based vector. That's, that's true, that did happen. So uh, researchers were looking at adenovirus-based therapies as a means to deliver gene therapy. And in particular, there's a relatively rare liver disease called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. So researchers were using very, very large doses of viral particles, uh, 3.8 times 10 to the 13th virus particles, in order to affect enough cells in the liver uh, to overcome the genetic deficiency. Now, in this one particular patient, uh, the massive dose that they used triggered a massive potent immune response, which unfortunately resulted in the death of this particular patient. So as a result of that, um, the FDA and the NIH halted gene therapy research for a little while, and they placed additional review measures in place uh, regarding the use of gene therapies and recombinant DNA technology in order to identify what happened and prevent it from happening again. So uh, after a few years, uh, gene therapy research picked up again and has been going strong ever since. So to help you understand, the doses used in the current vaccines that we're talking about, the J&J &J vaccine in particular, um, are much, much smaller. So the dose there is uh, 5 times 10 to the 10th virus particles. So that's 760 times less than the dose given in the case that was mentioned above. Uh, these vaccines have been extensively studied. When you look at the J&J &J vaccine, they had almost 45,000 participants in their clinical trial and uh, they've been shown to be safe. So the FDA was well aware that this was a potential concern, and so they kept a very close eye on this to make sure that this was not, that there was no evidence whatsoever that anything like this was taking place. So uh, one potential myth, uh, hopefully that you weren't aware of, that now you're equipped to answer some questions about. The second question that you may have heard about is, uh, do adenovirus-based vaccines um, increase my risk for infection. And so this is based on some uh, work that was done in the early 2000s where uh, they were looking to create a vaccine against HIV. 
and adenovirus-based vaccines were again used, and they potentially made people more susceptible to infection from the HIV virus. So once again, this is in fact true. Uh, however, this occurred due to a very specific set of circumstances kind of coming together. So let's talk about that. Uh, the vaccine that was being used targeted a virus, in this case HIV, which is known to infect immune cells or T cells more specifically. Uh, the vaccine was successfully able to induce antibodies against the HIV virus. Unfortunately, the antibodies were not neutralizing, so they weren't able to stop the infection. And so at this point, it's important to understand how antibodies work. Antibodies really have two main portions. There's the variable portion that actually binds to the antigen, and then there's the constant portion. That constant portion sort of serves as the structural backbone of the antibody, but it also serves as a signal to the rest of the immune system that says, hey, I've bound to something, come check this out. Well, uh, in the case of a virus that infects immune cells, uh, having a flag that says, hey, come check this out, is um, essentially you're luring in additional T cells for the virus to infect. And so uh, not a good combination, as you can imagine. Um, additionally, uh, vaccines are designed to elicit a potent immune response. And it turns out that HIV virus replicates best in activated immune cells. And so that combination uh, may have made people more susceptible to infection uh, from the HIV virus. So it accomplished the exact opposite of what we were trying to do. But again, that's a very specific set of circumstances. And, and when, as soon as you take those things away, that chain is broken and you don't have that same level of risk. So COVID-19 does not infect immune cells and infects other types of cells. So it's highly unlikely that we'd see this uh, vaccine enhanced disease. Additionally, uh, the FDA was acutely aware uh, of this circumstance. And so both the FDA as well as the manufacturers who were involved in the clinical trials were specifically looking to see if there was any evidence whatsoever of vaccine enhanced infection or vaccine enhanced disease. And there was uh, no evidence. And in fact, in the briefing document that the FDA put out, they specifically addressed that because this was such a concern. So uh, we definitely know that this is safe. So uh, again, these are probably more in depth questions than you'll get from most patients, but uh, they require a little bit more in-depth knowledge. So uh, this will wrap up our 15 on COVID-19 for today. But before we, go, before we end, uh, I just want to point you in the direction of uh, APHA's coronavirus uh, guide. And so uh, this is a fantastic place for uh, all kinds of resources related to COVID-19 practice resources, COVID-19 CE, the latest news and information, as well as information about upcoming webinars. Uh, the link is there for you, so please don't hesitate to check that out, pharmacist.com slash coronavirus. Thank you very much for your attention. We hope you found this useful, and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode.